Today we're just going to speak for a few moments. Never know how long. And we're going to talk about anybody heard the saying cart before the horse? Did you get the cart before the horse? It's kind of self explanatory what it means, but let's just think about it. In other words, it's kind of backwards, isn't it? A little hard if you got the horse behind the cart. And the only way it would even halfway work, and it wouldn't work very good, was for the horse to push the cart instead of pulling it. And so we're going to look at some examples in the Bible of people that did that, but the good news is we're going to see that through that all, there's some good news. So it's not bad news, but let's start off by, because I think we have all felt this. So do you ever feel like you've missed it? Yeah. I mean, I used to love, the, are you doing all you can for God? Well, all of us are going to, you know, uh, and so what does that do to us? Yeah. And it's really backwards of how God sees us, and that's what we want to talk about today, and how God's for us. See, we got to get it in our head, no matter what, God's for us, and He's not against us. Now, does that mean, as we go, people like to take it to the extreme, and we're preaching, just go sin, you know, uh, like the old Budweiser commercial, grab all the gusto you can get, you know, you're only going through here one time. And, well, you know, that gusto, unfortunately, in our family, we see that gusto has a price. You know, my uh, father was an alcoholic, so the only positive thing that came out of that relationship, other than I eventually become to know the Lord, was that I decided I'd never drink. Because I know if I never drink anything, I'd never be an alcoholic. And that's usually how it starts, you know. I don't know if there's any wisdom there for anybody, but that, it does start with one drink, usually. And that person, for whatever reason, decides they need more, so... <coughs> There was only two of us brothers out of the six of us that made that decision. Some of the rest of them decided to try it out. And fortunately, most all of them have come to the Lord now and gotten free from that also. But uh, as I look around and see people held captive to different things, I just I'm just glad that I'm free. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm getting freer every day. How about do you ever feel like God can't use you? Well, there's another lie. Have you ever made any mistakes that you felt took you off the path, you know, that God had for you or the plan he had for your life? And I'm not asking you to answer, but see, I can answer yes to all these. And probably in your heart you could say, yeah, I, I felt like that. But see, we, we again, we can't go by feelings. Yes, let's admit it. We all missed it. In fact, the world missed it so bad that that's why Jesus came. Well, actually, Adam missed it and caused us all to enter in. So we're not alone if we've ever had those feelings. That's what I'm trying to lead up to. Because I guarantee there's no temptation, and that is in a sense a temptation that hasn't come to all of us, to try and get us off our focus off of who we are, who Jesus is, and what he did for us. Because if he can do that, then we're not, who are we really focusing on through all these statements? We're focusing back on us again, which is a mistake. Because the Bible tells us not to focus on us, but to look in the perfect law of liberty and see what God sees in us. Yeah. So we've got to look at what God sees in us. So, so by this thinking, sometimes technically we're going to, we're doing backwards. Curry used to preach about the backwards church, and and as a Christian church as a whole, I think he's got some truth there. The, the church has got it backwards, and. Um, so very few are really preaching the grace message, and then those that are, like Pastor Joe's mentioned, and they want to take it to the extreme, and we're saying just go for it, and do anything you want. And that's never been preached here, and never will be preached here. Amen. So, but we're going to look at some examples. We're going to, you know, the Bible said the Old Testament, instead of using it as a club sometimes, which we like to do to get people, like I told you with Malachi, I was good at preaching tithing, boy, I thought, God's with me, you know, and you got to squeeze all the money out of these people. But gee, that contradicts a pretty plain scripture that you need to give cheerfully. And uh, I've been there where I haven't given cheerfully. I'm sure you have too. That I gave under compulsion. And I felt well, like, you know, or the other extreme to that is, and kind of getting off my messy, but just to show you how we get the cart before the whole course sometimes, we get things backwards. Then it got to the point where people said, well, if you want God to bless you, then you have to get more. In other words, if you need more, your receiving from God is based on your giving. You know what I'm saying? You set the amount God's going to bless you. Now, where in Scripture does it say that? But we'll pull out some Scriptures and try and use it and, again, put people under pressure. Well, 
And, that, and there's truth to sowing and reaping, so don't get me wrong. You know, there's truth that sometimes if we feel like we should give and it's really God, first of all, if it's God, we will give it cheerfully. You know, it's He'll give us the grace, He'll give us the desire to do it. And I've had times like that where yeah, it didn't bother me a bit. And I said, well, we got it, and I believe God wants us to give it, and we've done it. And, you know, we've given away cars and different things. And, you know, just because we felt like that was God. That's why we're here. Amen. So I don't think we made a mistake coming here either. But Abraham, he's a good example. You know, the thing is, in the Bible, we elevate people, which we we should respect <coughs> Abraham. We're going to look at Moses and some of these people in the Bible that we hold up as Bible heroes. And technically they are. But did they ever miss it? Did they ever get the cart before the horse? Well, I think Abraham's a prime example. And I'm going to be reading from Genesis 15 just to give you the story. I just want to make sure everybody knows the story. Probably most of you do, but you know, there's always a chance we have somebody that's never heard the story. And this is actually before God renamed Abraham. He was called Abram. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is not my heir. In other words, he never had a child. So he's asking God. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou shalt not be thine heir, this Eliezer, but he shall come forth out of thy own bowels, shall be thine heir. In other words, you're going to have your own child. This is God. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell me the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he continued, and he counted it to him for righteousness. In other words, he believed God. And that sounds great, doesn't it? But we, if you don't know what happened, we'll get to it, but I think most of you know what happened. We're going to read that scripture. Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 16. So we're just a chapter later in Genesis, and we're going to start in verse 1. And we're just going to read a little bit and see, okay, it said we ended up with Abraham believing God. That God told him, hey, you're going to have a child, and it will be your own, and it will be from your own, own loins. It won't be anybody else. And so now Sarai, again, Sarah was renamed later to Abram's wife, bear him no children, as we just were reading before in chapter 15. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, I pray thee, go in unto my, my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham, Abram, hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So, I believe wives are supposed to be a blessing, but they can miss it too. <laughs> Most of the time, though, you know, I find it to be, or my wife to be a blessing, and she knows and adds to the things that I need to know, and, and so we count on each other, and that's the way a marriage should be. You know, it's 100% each way. Did you know that? It's not 50 50? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Joe. <laughs> so. He listened to his wife, but, you know, just the chapter before, just a few verses before, he said he believed God. And so really, Abram, at this point, should have said, look, you know, it's not God. Actually, his wife was wrong, I believe. It's never God that believes to restraining the wife. That doesn't make sense. We go, Adam and Eve go multiply and replenish the earth, and now, hey, sorry, don't want you to have children. So that kind of goes against that scripture right away. So Abram really should have told his wife, look, God took me outside and said, if I can number the stars, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have a bunch of descendants. It's going to be from us. Of course, she could have said, well, it will be from you, just not me. Because <laughs> that's what she was saying. And she wanted him to go in. And so he listened to her. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 12 years in the land of Canaan, gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, all of a sudden, we see her mistress was displeased in her eyes. In other words, Sarai sounded like a great plan to her, but as soon as she conceived, it wasn't so fun then, was it? And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon me. Now I made a mistake. 
I'd given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. In other words, the maid was saying, what? I had a child with your husband, and you ain't got nothing. And so <laughs> you can see that one over well. And the Lord's judge between me and thee. So she realized she made a mistake. It was a little too late. You know, um, we all know that sin has consequences. Yes, we're forgiven. Yes. I mean, if I go rob a bank, does that mean if I become a Christian a day later, everything's okay and I'll never go to jail? How about if I do it when I'm a Christian? God's forgiven me, but there's a penalty. So, obviously, now we know what happened today. If you know anything about history, or if you don't, we know why there's a conflict between Israel and all the other nations. Isn't it amazing that they want that little sliver of land, and yet you add up all the nations the Arabs have, or the Palestinians, or whatever you want to call them, and yet they want what Israel has. In fact, really, the ones that are truthful don't want Israel to exist at all. So obviously that was a big mistake, right? I mean, a huge mistake in a way. But I've said this before, and I always chuckled when this other pastor said it, but it makes so much sense here. God never gets confidence pants now. In other words, this didn't catch him off guard. That's true. Because we know he did fulfill his word, right? And of course, Abraham had a son, and out of that, of course, his descendants became the Jewish nation that we know today. All right? So God, here's my point out of the whole thing. Yeah, they made a mistake, and in a way, it's a huge mistake that affects the whole world today. Think about it. Think about how the conflict over there affects our oil prices. I mean, everything. Somebody hiccups over there, man, something shoots up, and you know we don't know what's going to happen. And that all started because of one mistake. But look at the good side. God kept his word and never gave up on Abraham, did he? He could have said, you big dummy. <laughs> you fool. Look what you've done. I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to find another guy that listens to me. I know. <laughs> he, he stuck with Abraham, didn't he? And Abraham stuck with him. So that's good news. So, I mean, I'm showing you the bad side. The reason I'm showing you that is because we've all missed it. Not maybe as big as this. Sin is sin. Missing it is missing it. But God doesn't give up on you, so don't give up on him. He's always for you, like I said. Amen. How about Joseph? Now, Joseph, people can question. I don't know why I've always felt this way. I just felt when God reveals something to you, sometimes maybe it's not the right time to tell everybody. That's right. That's just the way I've always felt about Joseph. So you can say, well, I don't know if that's true or not. That's fine. So it's just my feeling is that I think he made a mistake telling his brothers, look. And you can imagine, they didn't like it. And this can be found in Genesis 37. And we'll just read a portion of it. I think you all know it. But he dreamed a dream and he told it to his brothers. And they hated him yet the more. <laughs> See, they didn't like him already. Why didn't they? Because the father liked him, right? So now he has this dream, and I'm just going to tell you the dream, but you're welcome to read it there if you want. Genesis 37, 5 through 11. <clears throat> where he was out binding sheaves, and all his brother's sheaves bowed down to his. Right? And then he went out and he told them he dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars of the priest, they worshiped him. So you can imagine this didn't go over too good with his brothers, right? First of all, they didn't like him anyway because he was daddy's favorite. You know? But now he's saying, well, you guys are going to all, you know, what's going to Well, and I could be wrong. Like I said, I just always felt that maybe he shouldn't have said anything and just kept it. Maybe shared it with his dad who wouldn't have told all the brothers knowing that God was involved in this. And so you can say what you want, but look what happened. He got taken captive into Egypt, right? But all through that, well, what's the good part of that story? Everybody remember what all happened to him? Even in jail, he got promoted, didn't he? That's right. I mean, you couldn't keep him down. Why? Because God didn't give up on him. And guess what? Obviously, Joseph didn't give up on God in this dream he had. So there was a purpose for the dream. And so whether it was right or wrong, he said anything, I guess I just always wondered. Do you wonder if he hadn't said anything except maybe to his dad? And it would have all happened another way. We don't know. But see, God's always got, like I said, he's never caught in his pants now. So 
<laughs> However it was supposed to work, if it wasn't supposed to work this way, God worked through it. He stayed with Joseph Amen. and he had a plan. <coughs> How about Moses? Same thing. God had a plan for him, but do you often wonder maybe if he I'm just going to go ahead and paraphrase, but this story is found in Exodus 2, 11 through 15. And I hesitate to read a bunch of scriptures, but just to give you the story, he went out because he knew, and how, whoever knows how it was revealed, maybe through his real mom, that he was in a Jewish descent. He went out there and saw his brothers getting abused and beaten. They were forced into hard labor. And he ended up killing an Egyptian, right? Thinking that he... Because in his heart, God put it in his heart, obviously, that he knew he was going to be supposed to deliver his people out of Egypt. But when he went out there, he ended up killing a person. So that's murder, right? Capital murder. First degree or whatever you want, premeditated or second degree at the least. He went out there and got mad and said, I'm just killing this guy. So he ended up killing an Egyptian. And do you think all the Jewish people that were watching him said, wow, our Savior's here. He's going to take us out of here. No, they turned on him and said, you know, what, who do you think you are, basically? And, you know, he knew he was going to get turned into the Pharaoh. And so he had to take off, didn't he? And so how much longer was it? And again, see, I always wonder, because I like to wonder about things. Forty years. What if he hadn't done that? You see what I'm saying? I mean... I think he made a mistake. And Joseph, you can say, well, maybe his wasn't a mistake. I kind of think he made a mistake. <laughs> but that's just me because I don't know. But again, what happened? Did God give up on Moses? Yeah. And did Moses really give up on God? He probably wondered. <laughs> I know he had to wonder. And you know, 40 years is a long time. Sometimes we read these stories just like him killing somebody. Oh, yeah, you know, he murdered somebody. That, that's not something that we can just say, well, just go kill somebody. But God was still with him. God still had a plan for his life. God didn't give up on him. Amen. Now, I'm sure Moses, like I said, when he was out in the wilderness and he wasn't living in the luxurious palace, getting his baths and whatever else and all this, he probably wondered. And he probably knew that he made a mistake by killing this Egyptian. So, I'm just showing you examples of people that are heroes in the Bible, but they missed it big time. To me, murder is big time sin, right? So, I just want to encourage you as we go through today, by giving you a few examples of people that we look up to, and with good reason, because they stuck with God, and for a lot of the reasons today, we have, well, we have the Old Testament that we can look back. There's God again. He's preserved his word and always will. But let's go to uh, Hebrews. I want to just read here a little bit about Moses. And that's found in 11 chapter, and we'll start the 23rd verse. So, giving you the background, he fled and went into the desert. And, of course, God called him. You remember the burning bush. I'm sure everybody's hopefully seen the Ten Commandments movie. Not that it's very realistic, because they always take away from the Scripture. I wish somebody, maybe someday, will. Even in the series, the mini series of the Bible, I was a little disappointed, I'll be honest. Because I would like the Bible to just be the Bible. I would like to see it the way it yeah. says right here. I don't want somebody saying, like when they came out of Egypt, you see the guy with the little crutch, right? The guy getting carried on a stretcher. That's not the Bible. The Bible says they came out and they were all healthy and whole and they came out rich and prosperous right. gee you look at the Ten Commandments I mean some of them were barely making it so <laughs> they had to be carried on a cart so why can't we just I don't get it are they afraid if they made the Bible it might affect the world if they did it the way it says how hard can it be but anyway it's <laughs> okay by faith Moses when he was born was hid three months from his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Let's just stop there for a moment and have a little side point. Anybody that says there's not pleasure in sin, there is. But notice it's only for a season. Uh, back to people that drink. They say, oh, I had a good time, and they suffer the next two days. And I'm thinking... 
gee, the trade-off's not too good here. I mean, I never drank, so I can't. But I see people. When I saw my dad come off of one of his big binges, and for the next week he's sick on a horse, and I'm thinking, somehow I'm missing the fun part of this. You, know, you were happy for three or four days, and now for the next two weeks your body's trying to recover. And you're sicker than a dog. And, okay. So it might have pleasure for a season, but do you ever think of the downside? <laughs> I don't care what it is we're talking about, whether it's drugs or whatever. You might have the high, but there's the time you come down. So there's only, sin has does have pleasure, but it's only for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So he didn't give up on God. I'm sure he had his doubts out there on the wilderness. Wondering, gee, you know, and then even when God approached him, what did he say? Well, I'm not a man of good speech. I, you know, I can't do this. So God gave him a helper, of course. But we know the story. He did deliver his people. How about David? We look up to David a lot, but he committed several crimes. <laughs> Didn't he? But let's talk about David's patience first before we might not even dwell on his crimes, or maybe just a little. But let's look at the good side of David. He was anointed king, right? And Saul was still king. And did he come in there? See, this is kind of the opposite of what I think maybe the other two should have done. Okay, this is my thing. <coughs> when he was anointed king, did he just come in and say, Saul, you're done, and come in? No, he had a little army with him this whole time, right? But what did he do? He wouldn't touch Saul. Did he have several opportunities? Yes. If you go back and read the Bible, there was a time when Saul and his army were sleeping and they snuck down and David cut off a piece of his robe to show that, hey, I was there. I could have stuck my sword right in you and it had been all over. And he went up on the hilltop and then he yelled and woke up Saul and said, look, look, king, I could have taken your life. And so that caused Saul at that time to, of course, repent, be sorry, and went back. But, of course, he was after him again. Another time, when he went into a cave where David was hiding, I actually to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I was to tell you the truth. So here Saul's in a pretty, what would you call it? Vulnerable. Vulnerable, yeah. yes. <laughs> Not sure what the facilities were there, but let's say uh, he was maybe reading the Jerusalem Post and pretty relaxed. <laughs> and, uh, so he could have taken this. <laughs> Sorry. That's what happens with the imagination. So he could have taken his life real easily, right? And he did. So to me, that demonstrated, yes, David knew I'm the king. Technically, I'm the king right now. God said, I'm anointed the king. As soon as he was anointed, technically, he is the king in God's eyes. But he did not touch Saul. Saul died, of course, falling on his own sword. So anyway, David had patience and waited. You know, so I think that's a good example. Yes, he knew. God said I'm the king. But he did not rush in and take over that position until the other king died. Okay. But David had his faults. Like I said, we'll touch on that. What did he do? He created, he committed murder, not directly, but he endorsed a murder, didn't he? And he committed adultery. So look looking through all those stories, what do we see that we preach today though? What else do we see that these people, how could he do that? God didn't just take him out. We see grace there too, don't we? Yeah. We see grace with Abraham. We see grace with Moses. We see grace with David for sure. I mean, the law was there then. Yes, Abraham didn't have the law. Moses, of course, did get the law after the murder. But still, <laughs> David was living under the law. And yet, what? He knew... And he even wrote about God's grace. All right, so that was the good news. So how about Israel? Let's look in Romans, and then we're going to get into the hopefully the good news, better news, if this isn't good already. Romans 10, and of course Paul wrote Romans, and he's speaking about his brethren, the Jewish nation. And he's starting in verse 1. And he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel is that they might be saved. 
For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And this is kind of where we are sometimes in the church. Let's read these next few verses. For, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, which he's already made you righteous if you accepted Jesus as Lord, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Or again, I mean, here's some plain scriptures. <laughs> so I don't know how we miss it. For Christ is the end of the law or righteousness to everyone that believes. Christ is the end of the law. So why do we still, we don't hear, but why does the church as a whole want to bring law in? You know, uh, we've had friends of ours even say, well, you need a little law. <laughs> okay, if you could find a scripture that would tell me that, then maybe I would agree with you. But see, we, we come up with our thinking sometimes, and that causes us what? Get the cart before the horse. And then we wonder why things don't work. Because our thinking, we're against what God's already said. He's made you righteous. He's made you holy. You're wall to wall Holy Ghost, the third of you is. The rest of you will follow once we get this thing between our mind. I mean, the, the body is just the trailer. It's hooked on to the rest of it, and wherever the soul and the spirit and the, the mind go, the body's going to go. So the good news, even all these examples of these men that we just looked at, they made mistakes, but God, like I said earlier, was still with them. God didn't give up on them. God hasn't given up on you. Amen. And he never will. Don't give up on him. And you might say, what do you mean by that? Well, when you get your thinking wrong and you think God's not for you, then you kind of let loose and think, well, he, he's not for me. And you give up on him. Don't give up on God. He didn't give up on you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, for, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So mm -hmm. It's a gift. Yes. Yet we continually, it goes on to say again, these are plain scriptures, not of works. Lest any man should boast. And yet that is what happens. Why? For we are all... <coughs> His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so what kind of workmanship does God have? Is he a sloppy workman? No, no, no. So why do we look at ourselves? If he, if we, he says we're his workmanship, which we are, then we ought to see what workmanship he has made and not make assumptions. Because when we make assumptions, we get the cart before the horse. And things don't work right. And so, it's a gift. And yes, what, what sometimes causes us not to is pride. Let's boil it down. Sometimes it's just pride. We think we can do it, or we don't want to bother God. Or, you know, I mean, God doesn't mind being bothered. In fact, he tells us to come boldly into the throne anytime we have a need. But what happens sometimes? We get the car before the horse, and we say, well... I think I can take care of that. Well, how did it work for Abraham? How did it work for Moses? Not too good. So, I just want to encourage you today that God's not giving up on you. I don't care where you're at. You know the beauty of it is He has a plan for each and every one of you. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But that's okay. You're uniquely created. There's nobody else like you. Now some of you are thinking in your mind, thank God. No. You see? That's wrong. <laughs> You're looking at yourself wrong if you had that little thought jump in your head. Well, thank God, it's only I'm the only one. Well, we might say that in jest, but realistically, we shouldn't think that way. We should think, you know what? God created me special. I was going to try and find that Bill Gaither song. Remember that from years ago? I'm something special. I'm the only one of a kind. It's a little boy singing it, actually. I think Bill Gaither wrote it. He's given me a body and a bright, healthy mind. See, little children sing that, and they accept it. Yeah. They're open. They say, yeah, you know, God loves me. <laughs> now when we get older and wiser, well, I don't know. I kind of messed up, so maybe God's not there for me. Yeah, he's there for you. Yeah. You see these heroes? That's what I wanted to show you. These people we look up to, they missed it big time. Yeah. And sometimes we just read the scripture, and that's all we do. We just read, yeah, he killed somebody. Yeah, he killed somebody. Yes, he committed adultery. Yes, you know, all these things. we got to look at it. 
like God saw. He had mercy on them. They had, they had grace. Amen. All right, let's look at Ephesians. And I'm going to start in chapter 2, verse 9 here in a moment. We're going for the two hours today, brother. Okay. <laughs> Let me get the you extra cards. Just put card. in another CD. I'll get the extra cards right. out. All of you that are, don't get up and leave. <laughs> oh, now you want to do the 15 on me. Is that really for real? That's for real. Oh, gee. <laughs> That's a little more windy than I thought today. Huh? Pastor Joe, that joining shook hands with me this morning. It came on me. <laughs> ah, it's a little joke. All right, let's look there. It says, not because of works, not the fulfillment. This is out of the Amplified way, the way I should have told you that, that I'm reading. Chapter Ephesians 2, 9, verses 10. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. So we're looking at the same scripture, but in the Amplified. It is not the result of what anybody could possibly do. No one can pride himself in it or take glory from himself. In other words, I mean, if we just stop and think sometimes, what are you going to give God? Hmm. I mean, even people that think they're living this good life and probably good enough and I'm probably going to get into heaven. Really? I mean, really? You think you're living that good that God's going to just let you slide in? No, that's why Jesus came. Right? You pop your bubble. You know, but even people that think, well, you know, see, and I used to think that way when I was, a, I'm going to say it, a Catholic. So if you're watching and you're Catholic, hello. <laughs> We're still brothers. But, see, I never thought I'd make it to heaven. See, they preached purgatory then. And that meant you could get in there. That's kind of between hell over here and that's between heaven. So that's like a little holding tank because you weren't quite good enough to make it. <laughs> and so you get in there and guess what they teach you? Well, through prayers and money, people can get you out of there. Sounds like here in this world, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that was going along fine. Fortunately, I was born again, but at that time, I still went to the Catholic Church because I thought, oh, I don't know anything. All I did is start going every day. Man, see, right before work, I'd go what well, they call a mass, but I, whatever. And so I, I wanted to serve the Lord, and I was excited, so I went to church. And so then I asked this deacon, I said, well, what about purgatory? And he says, well, that's one of those things you can either believe or not. That wouldn't have been good news if I was still a Catholic because I was dependent on that. Now he's telling me, well, it's one of those gray areas, you know, and at least he was being truthful. <laughs> I don't know how much longer he had his job. All right. Let's go on and read. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do good works, which God predestined or planned beforehand for us, taking paths that which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he has prearranged and made ready for us to live. Alright, now all this sounds very similar to the Joseph, to the Moses, to the Abraham. Maybe you didn't have a vision or a dream, but we have scripture, we have a more sure word, really. We can't just depend on a dream. See, they didn't have the word, let's, let's think back. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have Ephesians. We've got a more sure word of prophecy today. So no matter what dream or what prophet comes and talks to you, you better make sure it lines up with the word. Amen, that's right. Because if it doesn't, that's where people get off base again. Okay, so we have this word that God told me right here. He's got a plan that he prepared a way long time ago for me. Right? And you. I'm not leaving you out, so stick with me. He has a plan for your life. And you might say, it doesn't seem like it. Well, it says here he does. Right? And he's got it laid out for you. Now we can mess it up, sure. Just like they did. <laughs> Remember? Abraham kind of messed it up. Moses kind of messed it up. Joseph, I still say he messed it up. But God was still there. And guess what? Yes, through all that, did God still come back and get his plan to yeah. yes. so he's not done with you yet right? so if you think well I, I don't see no plan in my life well you're still here aren't you <laughs> and that plan is still in effect yes. right? right Right. and so sometimes because we're focused so much on ourselves when we turn our focus on the Lord and say hey, 
you know. See, I never asked him, should I come to this church? Just so you know. In fact, I've never, it's just like God says, it's time to go. That's the way I put it. And my wife, who's been my wife now almost 23 years, so we've made a couple moves that way, and she always confirms it. Like this last move here, just to share with you that God has a plan. I don't know what all I'm supposed to do here, but I'm here. I know this is where I'm supposed to be. And he hasn't told me any different. But we were in a church, just so you know, and this isn't to say anything about me, it's to say about God. We were there for 20 years. We helped that pastor start his church. Similar to what we're trying to do here, kind of a groundbreaking and trying to get the church going. And actually at that time, just to show you how the flesh can enter in, we were going to Kenneth Anthony's camp meeting pretty regularly back then when he was still alive. And we enjoyed that quite a bit. And our pastor, one that the church I had just left for 20 years, had gone to Raymond. And actually he was here and his brother was my pastor at that time. And then he felt he was called to go to Raymond. That's what he did for two years. And he said goodbye, I don't think I'll see you because I believe we're going to go to Europe. Well, you know how we have our plans and God has his. Well, God told him, no, you're coming back to Denver after he graduated. So he did. And we were going to a church where my brother still goes now. And of course, like I said, we were going to camp meeting. And uh, we were sitting there and something inside me just said, you know, you should go help Pastor Dan. That's his name. And... <clears throat> But see, we were always good friends. So I drew back and said, well, I would love to do that because he's my friend, number one. So that would be great. So I thought, it's probably just me. But a little later on, then I said something to Irene. I said, well, you know, I just feel like this. And she said, yeah, I think so too. So from then on, and then I always try to do it the right way. <laughs> the pastors maybe don't appreciate it, but I went to the pastor of the church we were going to and said, what we believe God wants us to do. He gave us his blessing. You know, it's kind of hard when you're you know, committed to a church and they know you're there and then you have to leave. So we did. And we met in hotels. And so maybe I could say, well, gee, I was in this nice bigger church. And now i got to help set up equipment. i got to see we've been there before. It doesn't bother me. And so so we stayed there 20 years. Never really thought we were ever going to leave. The Lord came this way. Or how will we go? <laughs> <laughs> the Star Trek transporter, I don't know, but anyway. So we, uh, and actually, to be honest, I really didn't know Pastor Joe, so this is how it shows how God, you know, I think I met him two or three times. I met him once at Curry's uh, camp meeting in Boldwell, his uh, PhD. And then we didn't go to the camp meeting that they had. And then uh, we met him over at another DHT. And he introduced himself actually in Boulder to us. He was sitting behind us. The Lord, maybe? I don't know. But he was friendly, like he always is. And we had a break, and he introduced himself, said, You know, I'm Pastor Joe Panero. And right now I'm in New York, but Curry's asked me to come out here and start a church. And it was great, we thought, you know, nothing. And said a few more words. And then at the other DHT, Curry was long winded, real long winded. And so I snuck out, told Irene in a few minutes, you sneak out. <laughs> and Joe, Pastor Joe, Pastor Randy, no. <laughs> he was sitting out in the, like on the couch out in the foyer or whatever, we were getting ready to leave. And I saw him and we stopped and talked. And he did ask me then what church you going to. I said, well, basically, Word of Faith. Oh, those are good churches. <laughs> he, just so you know, he never asked me, never come. Never hinted. You know, he just said again, yeah, Started church, or maybe they already have. It's kind of Octoberish, so I think they were on the verge of starting something then. Still, even then, never entered into my mind. You know, we need to go help Joe. And so, and then I think we came here one Sunday. Well, actually, by then we kind of. So on our anniversary, this is just a few months later. It just felt in my heart that we we're supposed to go help Joe. I said something to Irene, and she says, you know, I've been feeling that for a long time, but I figured you'd never leave this church because, you know, Pastor Dan's your friend. And we actually had a business together, too. And so she said, I just didn't think you'd ever leave, even though I didn't feel like we should. <coughs> and so 
So I drag my feet. That's one fault maybe I have. Maybe it's a good one. Because usually I'll not just jump in. So maybe that's a good thing compared to these others. So, so that was like at the first of the year, coming up on three years almost now. And so technically I feel like today I probably should have told my other pastor that month and you know, at the end of this month. That is basically what I told him, but it wasn't until February, so I drug it out another month. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if this story is going to help anybody. I didn't really have this in my notes, but God knows what he's doing. So. I don't know what he's like to talk about myself, but I just want to show you how God has a plan for your life. Okay, and don't, don't hesitate to follow it. Now, you might drag your feet a little like I did. It wasn't because I didn't want to. And, and, but anyway, so in February, which I probably should have done in January, but we're only talking a month, so I think God, you know, he had a plan. So I approached the pastor one Sunday after church and said, I need to talk to you. Or maybe it was a gun class. Sorry. <laughs> that changed what I teach on an NRA instructor. So if you're all offended, one of you slipped out. <laughs> Might as well know it now. Anyway, so I took him in the office and uh, sat down and said, uh, well, I just feel like I need to let you know that I feel like I'm supposed to go. And I told him about Job. And he says, well, uh, how did you meet this guy? So I told him just like I told you. I said, to be honest, I don't really know him that well. You know, I knew him well enough to know he was sincere. But what I'm trying to tell you, I wasn't basing it on, gee, me and Joe become great friends, and Joe said, come on over anytime you want, and uh, you know, it didn't happen that way. I really didn't hardly know him at all. And I told the pastor that, of course, right away, you can see the red flags, well, you know, what's the name, what are you? And I said, well, this is the way I feel. I said, if nothing changes this month, you know, then we're going to leave me. I told him I'm not going to tell anybody. And my brother was going there too. And I said, I'm not going to tell my brother. I'm not telling anybody. I'm just telling you. Because he had this lady that he believed in prayer and had her. Well, I'm going to have her pray about this. Fine. <laughs> so really, obviously nothing changed. You know that. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the only, well, I don't even think I want to talk about that part. But I just want to let you know God had a plan. And they did bring us forward, and they prayed for us, and they sent us off. But through some other situations that's happened, I guess I feel like maybe they never really believed us, which, that you know, I understand. I mean, if I was a pastor, and you, you try to send people off the best you can, maybe some of them do go off, and they're wrong. But I did tell him this. Of course, I'm still here. But I said, you know, I'm big enough that if I know I missed it, I'll be back. I'll just come back. If I know I miss God, I'll I don't have a problem coming back here. And so that's where we are today. Like I said, I haven't felt any different. I only got through half of my notes, so I'm, let me see. I only got a few minutes left, I think. Well, let me share this little humor story. Rick always likes stories. I kind of gave you my story, so it wasn't too funny, was it? I love stories. I know. And sometimes stories add, but I'm, Pastor Joe is better because he sticks with the word. He's right when he says, I hardly had any stories. He gives you the, the full dose, doesn't he? Yes, he does. So I give you the fluff. <laughs> give you the dessert. He gives you the full meal, and I give you dessert. How's that? So we're a team. So his style is different than mine, but I still hope to get the main message across that God has a plan for you. We've all got the cart before the horse in our lives, and God hasn't given up on you. So there's this record when we were a kid, and I know Rick will relate, I don't know, Pastor Joe, maybe Red Scout put it out. It was called The Littlest Christmas Tree. And it was just him narrating. Red Scout was narrating, and he's, Irene loves it. See, I'm not into Christmas no more, Christmas trees and all that. But anyway, this story had kind of has a point. So the Christmas tree, of course, talks, and he's sitting there, and he's in the house. He's bemoaning himself. I just don't know my purpose. I don't know why I'm here. You know, they cut me down. They brought me in. I just don't get it. What, what, what's my purpose in life? That's the gist of the story. And of course, Santa Claus, which of course I don't believe in him either. Sorry, kids. <laughs> but <laughs> comes in, you know. And of course, the tree talks, and Santa's shocked. You know, oh, we had a talking tree. And so after, through it all, Santa talks to him and tells you, yeah, you got a purpose. Think tomorrow morning the kids get up and you got all the presents under the tree and you're laid up and their joy that you're going to share with them. And so it ends up, I, I know we put this. That's a deep talk. I don't know, kid. 
So I want you to know that God has a purpose for you. And I hope through this message today that you'll say, you know what, God, i, I got to be here for a reason. So if you're having some doubts, don't. Again, I'm going to tell you, God's for you. He's not against you. He's never been against you. He never will be against you. Amen. You could blow up big time. Look at these guys. And yet they got big. I don't think we'll ever end up in the Bible. I mean, you know, I don't think it's, <laughs> but David and Moses and uh, Abraham, they're all in here. But they blew it big time. And so there's nothing you can do that's going to take God away from you. So don't you give up on God. I guess that's the gist of my message. You know, we all got the cart before the horse. I don't care if None of us has lived the perfect life. We've all missed it. We've all said things we wish we hadn't said. Maybe a few of mine today. <laughs> but you know what? God's still for us. He's not against us. So I just want to bless you with that today. That God has such a, actually a perfect plan. If if we could just reveal it to the world that God had such a wonderful plan for their lives. We just haven't done it like we should. I haven't. Because people would come running. But unfortunately, the church as a whole, what have they preached? Condemnation and God's wrath and tornadoes and it's God not to get you. He's out to get you, but for the good way. Amen. <laughs> he, he wanted to get you. Yeah, I agree with that part, but not the way they're preaching. So unfortunately, and some big name preachers, and they influence a lot of people. And people, and I've been there where I just accept their word, and yet plain scripture says that's not true. Right. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? We, we get the cart before the horse. So, well, bless you, everyone. Does anybody have a need today? Yes. So can I say a couple things? You sure can, Pastor Joe. Well, two things came to me when you were when you were speaking. If I can share this, um, and and I'll just relate it with the prodigal son. Um, and this goes with everything that Randy said today. When these when people mess up, we get God's mercy. We we don't get what we deserve. So if you look at the prodigal son. He blew it big time, but when he came back to his father, his father welcomed him with open arms. That, that's mercy. But grace put a robe on his back. So God does not want to just forgive us and uh, you know welcome us and be there for us all the time. He wants to elevate us, as you said in, in Ephesians 2.10, as his workmanship and elevate us to a place of just lavishing his love and his self and everything that he has upon us. That's what grace is. The second thing I wanted to say, and this came to me when you were ministering, uh, I was preaching one night in a church back in New York, and I said this, I said, now you all know that God says he helps those that, God helps those that helps himself. They all said, yes, amen. I said, you all know that's in the Bible, right? And it's not. See, God helps those that go to him and, and go ask him for help. And God wants to be everything to us. So that thought, we have to get out of our mind that God helps those that helps themselves. He wants us to be totally 100% dependent and relying and trusting on Him for everything in our life. That's true. Because when we rely and trust in ourselves, we limit God to where He can bring us. And so that's a thought that came to me when you were ministering, because we all have that. God helps those that helps themselves. I was told that all my life by my dad, but it's not biblical. <laughs> it's actually anti-Bible. Yeah, it is. It's actually the opposite if we go through some more scriptures, which I had a few more, but that's okay. I never seem to finish. Maybe we'll do part twos on some of these messages because I've really never finished one. Getting that same thing, I guess. Whatever. Praise God. Does anybody have a need today? Anybody sick, weak? Okay. All right. Well, we'll pray here in a moment. I did forget to mention this earlier, and I don't know. Maybe everybody already knew about it. But next week, we're going to have our third annual church celebration. Okay, which we're just going to do it here for a variety of reasons. One, we don't know what the weather will be. It could be super hot out still or rainy. And we could, you know, could have went to the park. But we just decided it's, well, today doesn't seem like much air conditioning in here to me. But anyway, it's probably, we're going to just do it in here because we do have the kitchen and everything. And so if you'd like to be a part or you think you're going to come, we do have a, like a sign-up list here where you could put your name and maybe what you could bring. And if you can't bring anything, still come. Yep. Oh, you're one that's not bringing anything, sir. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's great. So, no, you're welcome to come. And, you know, if any of you are watching on the internet, come on and join your friend. Yeah. yeah. Bring somebody. You know, we just want to have a good time and celebrate our third year here. And so everybody's welcome. And 
if you can't yeah. bring anything or you know don't know how to cook, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this will be back on the table after church, and then if you, I know Irene's kind of been going around, but if you want to put your name on here, that's fine. Okay. Other than that, let's just pray, and we're going to dismiss. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. That it's gone forth not only here, and it is going to have an effect. Um, you can take words. I just know that uh, they go forth and they do have an effect in people's lives. So we thank you today that each and every one that's here and each and every one that's listening, you're free in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, hallelujah. <laughs>